function. So here are here are them. Oh, I wrote them in the non-decreasing way this time. So I will try to keep it consistent, but this time they're written as they're increasing. So there are five partitions of four, and that is reflected as the coefficient of q to the power four. There are two partitions of two, one, one, and two. They're reflected as the coefficient of two. So we move from these combinatorial objects to analytic objects, the series, and this helps us treat these objects in bulk instead of one by one. But it would be better if we actually have a better understanding of what this, what this uh, infinite sum is supposed to be. So if we have another representation, if we can find closed formulas. And for that, we will define the Q, uh, Q for hammer symbols. Here is A base Q sub L. This is given by this finite, uh, finite product of L elements. You start with one minus A, and then you raise powers of Q and you just uh, do L multiplications. And this is just a finite product. This is the generalization of a normal factorial. This is called the rising factorial, Q rising factorial, if you will. And here, if, if you're worried about convergence, you can take Q, the size of Q as a complex, uh, as a complex variable less than one and actually define an infinite product, a Q sub infinity is where the where that L is going to infinity. But you don't need to worry about this. Uh, this also converges in the formal power series ring. So if you don't want to deal with the convergence issues, you can just forget about this statement here. And we tend to have a lot of the same products in our calculations. We tend to see a lot of the same products with different starting points. So for that, we introduce a compression, uh, a shorthand notation. So if you have a lot of the same number of products, so if you have uh, a lot of cupel cameras with the same base and the same number of products, you can just tend, you can just put them together. So A1, A2, all the way to AK base Q sub L is just a product of these cupel cameras. All right, so these are just the definitions and how do they tie, tie together? If you look at this, the product uh, one over Q, Q sub N, this is the generating function for the number of partitions with parts less than or equal to N. So we, count, we were looking at the generating function for all the partitions. Now we have a generating function for the number of all the partitions with the, uh, with the extra condition that the parts needs to be less than or equal to N. So if you tend this next extra condition, if you replace it by taking N go to infinity, you would find the formula for the generating function for all the partitions. Also, this can also be interpreted as the generating function for the number of partitions where the number of parts is less than or equal to n. So there is this duality. Another example why these Q products are important is minus Q base Q sub n is the generating function for the number of partitions into distinct parts less or equal to n. Here, we're not gonna be able to replace it with number of parts for certain reasons that are easy to understand, but these are just some examples, some initial examples of why in the theory of partitions, we start seeing these cupocamer uh, symbols. And here's another example. If you were to have a one over Q2, Q5 sub infinity, this would mean that you start from a number two and your increments are of are of steps of five and you're, you have no bounds. So you're actually counting the number of partitions with parts, each being two mod five, and there are no restrictions on the size of the part. So this is the generating function for the partitions into two modulo five parts. So from this initial setup, you can actually see that this is the starting point of the modulus class the next exponent is the, the, res, uh, the modulus itself. This is the residue, this is the modulus, and this sub n, the, the bottom factor, the sub index gives you the bound. Okay, with that, I can now introduce the first partition identity. And that is the, oh, well, one more thing. So Q binomial factor, so this is the finite version of 
everything. This uh, this is generalization. So the Q, uh, this is the generalization of Q, the normal binomial coefficient. So the Q world, and this is to bound things. In the previous case, we were only able to bound the number of parts, or we were able only able to bound the size of the parts. Now with the Q binomials, we can bound the number of parts as well as the size of parts. So this Q binomial coefficient m plus n base m or base n, this is the generating function for the number of partitions that fits in an m by n box. So with this object, we can, by replacing our two Pokemons with this object, we can bound both the number of parts and the size of the parts. Okay, now let's move on to the partition identity. Here is the combinatorial version of the really, really famous Rajas Amanjan identity. And I'm pretty sure that well, this group knows it, but let me recite it again. There are two cases. It comes in a pair. I will read in M being one. The number of partitions with gaps between parts is greater or equal than two. So you count all the partitions where the gaps between consecutive parts are greater or equal than two is equal to the number of partitions where you only take parts one or four modulo five. So in one, this is connecting two different worlds of partitions and seeing that these two sets turn out to be equinumerous. In one world, you're counting partitions where you only consider the gaps between consecutive parts and you count all these partitions. And in the other world, you do not care about the gaps between parts at all. In fact, the parts can repeat even. But what you care is the congruence condition. You care that you part, your parts are either one or four modulo five, and you count all the partitions that way, and then the partitions of seven turns out to be equinumerous in both, in both sets, in both worlds, or the partitions of any number for that matter becomes equinumerous. So this is a really famous theorem, and analytically this is actually a beautiful theorem too. I mean, both ways it's beautiful. Analytically, this is a sum is equal to product identity. So you have a sum side, which is generally interpreted as the gap conditions, if we can. This is equal to a product, which is generally interpreted as the congruence condition. And as we were saying, like, well, that interpreting these type of products as congruence conditions is quite easy. So you start with M residue class and five minus M residue class as your parts, and you go with modulus five. So the the right hand side of this uh, of this identity is the generating function for the number of partitions where you have m or five minus m or m or minus m modulo five modulo five parts. Okay, so this is the this is a beautiful identity. I'm really interested in these type of identities, maybe more more complicated ones nowadays. But after all, this is what I'm interested in. And to prove such an identity, we need we need some grasp of it. So you can try to attempt to prove the combinatorial identity. Theoretically, there are bijective proofs, but they're only theoretically. So if you can find an actual bijective proof, I'm pretty sure you will be quite famous in my field and in combinatorics in general. And when it comes to this analytic identity, it is not so easy to prove. It actually requires really quite tough hypergeometric machinery under it. You, you need a Jacobi triple product identity. And technically there's one proof which doesn't require Jacobi triple product identity. Um, that is Andrews's proof by Jackson's identity, but Jackson's identity can imply Jacobi, J, Jacobi triple product. So in a sense, this is a hard thing to prove if you don't know it, uh, that if you don't know that it's actually true. Okay, so to prove that, there are many things that you can do. One attempt that you can try is to introduce a new variable. You can try to make this function into a bivariate function and try to, try to see it as maybe as a generating function. So let's take this uh, abstractification. So given a series in Q and one, why? And maybe more things, but we don't care about that right now. This bivariate function f y q is given by this. So you have y to the n. It's almost like a generating function, but more, more abstract in this, in this sense. It is a generating function, but more abstract. 
So right now I'm not indexing just numbers, but I'm indexing some polynomials or some functions in Q by the exponents of Y. And then if this function, the bivariate series satisfies a polynomial relation by shifting Y's to shifts of QI and with some coefficients in Q and Y, we call such a identity a Q difference equation. So here's an example. So I'm just taking the register of Manjian case with M is equal to one when this guy goes away and I'm introducing Y to the N into this function. This register Manjian related new series, new bivariate series satisfies this Q difference equation where the original series is split into y going to yq plus a coefficient in y and q and yq squared. Okay. All right. And moreover, this is actually really important that a q difference equation is related with a recurrence for the c for these coefficients a sub n uh, polynomial series, what uh, polynomials, uh, rational functions, whatever they are. So if you can find the q difference equation it is equivalent to a recurrence relation, a, a relation between these coefficients. And as you can see here, if y is one, we are talking about the register Manjian identity. So any information that we can find between these, between these objects that are related with the partition identity is invaluable to us. It is really valuable. Now, and more so, so introduction of these new coefficients doesn't need to be all witch work. We can actually uh, look at natural statistics and natural statistics and try to decide what, uh, what statistic we should be introducing, what variable we should be introducing or what the exponent should be to be more, more precise. So if you look at the Roger Samajan example, if you look at the series, in it is interpretation and in it's combinatorial interpretation the n, the summation uh, index, n here is actually counting the number of parts in the partition that we count with gap conditions. So plugging in, introducing this y to the n, we're indexing the number of parts with a new, new variable. So we're making our series into a bivariate series, but using a natural statistic. So we actually know what the statistic is supposed to be. And which actually in turn would mean that this relation that we introduced is related with the number of parts of this gap condition uh, of these partitions. Yeah. So in my package, in the package, we're gonna look at some more, uh, more difficult examples, but in the package, the point is you can now introduce any variable that you like, any statistic that you like, and try to guess a Q difference equation try to guess if such an equation of this form exists for your series, for your Q series. Okay, let's take a look at that. Um, first off, let me maybe make it a little bit larger. You can just uh, initialize the series. It says it is a Q function from Jacob and me. And for the full functionality, it says, please uh, load the holonomic functions by Christoph Kuchan. That is, gonna come in a little bit later. It has a lot of great applications inside of it. And plus I will also be loading the Sigma package. All of these packages are free available on RISC's website. So if you are interested in this, please contact Peter Paule and he will give you a password to download all of these things. Um, there's an error, it says creative telescoping exists but it is not an error with me. It's between sigma and holonomic functions. It's not a big deal for me. Okay, here's what it is. Uh, so we're looking at the sum of Q to the N squared divided by Q po camera Q, Q, N with the new introduced variable Y to the N. So this is just a register manjan sum with M equals one. You can make some data. It looks like this. I'm looking at uh, the coefficients of y here. So the y to the zero is 
coming with one, y to the one comes with q over one minus q, y to the two comes with q4, so on and so forth. Now we can try to guess a Q-shift equation. And the reason of guessing is just twofold. One thing you wanna know if this statistic is gonna give you something nice, I mean, visibly nice. And two, risk has a lot of packages that would help you to prove such a thing. So if you can guess it, if you know what it is, you can just use other packages of risk to actually prove these things. So guessing is actually the initial step. And this is usually the step where we get stuck. So it is, I, I found it valuable to be able to guess. And we created this algorithm to guess Q difference equations in this sense. Oh, it says Q shift equation, and this is not to uh, confuse anyone. Um, there are three major uh, equation types here, Q difference equations, Q differential equations, and Q recurrences. And because Q difference and Q differential sounds really the same, we took the name Q difference equations and implemented that as Q shift equations. That is what also some risk packages does, but Q shift equations is the same as Q difference equations. So here, we said, take my data, try to find a function that, says, that depends on Y and try order two in shifts order two in recurrences and order two in polynomial coefficients and try to find me a Q, Q difference equation. And it actually gave us a Q difference equation with some free variables. And it actually says, I need more restrictions, maybe set the expansion order higher. So use more values in the series. And these CIs are free constants for me in my guess. In such a situation, you can start actually dropping down these uh, coefficients, so you can try to use lower, lower values, uh, more restrictive systems to see if you can hunt down a better, better uh, Q difference equation. So here I'm taking the same data, same function name. I'm saying maybe we have a recurrence of order two. So I'm expecting Y, Q, Y, and Q squared Y as my shifts and an order one in the coefficients. So here's an example and it directly finds this thing, and this time it doesn't even say that I need more restrictions. This is the only, I, only Q difference equation that it finds. And here, as you can see, there's no equality. Everything in Q, that's because everything in Q functions package is set to be equal to zero. So that is to make our lives easier. So, in a sense. so yeah. Just had a question. So uh, could you please again repeat uh, what you had uh, when you have this 2 comma 2 and then when 2 comma 1. So you said you had, uh, I mean, can you describe those parameters? Of course, of course. And you can also do it this way. So you can just say, uh, so guess Q shift equation, a question mark, you can hit it and it will give you all the explanation here. Okay. You can also check the paper too. So there are uh, some there's some documentation in the package and also in the paper, but what this is, is the first thing here is, how big do you think your recurrence is? What is the order of your recurrence? Mm -hmm. So how many shifts do you expect? So what goes inside this F function? So I expect to see Fy, Fqy, and Fq squared y. So that is the two, that is that order of recurrence that I assume. If I were to, make this three. Now I'm also expecting Q cube Y and maybe I will see a larger system. So let me make it two again. And here I'm also seeing this Q cube Y. That is the system's size and shifts in the function. It is a good idea to start big and then shrink it down. And the second thing is the coefficients of the, the polynomial coefficients of this system. So what do you think the exponents of these coefficients will be? So the power of Q, the power of Y. I'm expecting them to be at most two here. I'm expecting them to be at most two, at most four here. And then we will start seeing Q for Y2. You can even look at other things. You, here you can actually take it into two pieces. You can say I'm expecting um, order four in 
in Y and order two in Q or the other variant. I, I believe it's order four in Y and order two in Q, yes. Just, just as in that. So you can make it into a list here too. Mm -hmm. Okay. But after all, right. once you start seeing something, you can shrink it down and try to guess a, guess a Q shift equation. So here, let me do it this way. Here, I'm expecting an order two recurrence where the exponent of Y is at most order two and exponent of Q is at most order one. And then mm -hmm. it hunts down these, this recurrence. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Essentially, one one is going to give us the same thing. Essentially, this one one is the same as having just one. When you put it just a number, it is uniform to all Q, Y, and any other variable. And if it is uh, just mm. make, made into a list, then you're actually specifying one by one. Mm. All right. You can do even more. You can just say, I want the highest order factor to be of this shape, of this exact term, one minus yq. Is there a q difference equation where the highest order factor is exactly one minus yq? You can just search for that, you can, and it will find you something, it would add that, but here this is really a simple example that you're not getting any new, new information. It is the same formula here, but every, everything is multiplied with one minus qy. You can fix the lowest order term. You can fix the highest order term. They can come in handy. Um, you can set the expansion order higher as this guy suggests. If you believe that um, the first 20 coefficients didn't cut it, you can just use more coefficients from your series to actually increase the number of restrictions and get a smaller answer. And yeah, so this is just the initial guessing stage. Okay. And once it's guessed, as I was saying, it is really easy to prove. And yes, I, I have a question as well. Please. Uh, from the recursion formula, can you prove that the Rogers Romanogen identities satisfy the product formula? We cannot. No. I, as far as I know, there is no, no way. And um, I was going to show it but let's do it that way so we have the q difference equation yeah. here we said this is the same as the q recurrence equation so you can take your q shift equation and you can change it to a recurrence relation to q shift equation to a recurrence equation You can take your shift equation here, you can this, and let's say the coefficients are a of n, then the, uh, is this q, why is it? What am I doing wrong? So two, ah, to a q recurrence equation. And then, so, I take my Q shift equation. I want to shift it to a recurrence equation for the coefficients, and you can just do that. The package does this symbolically. It is automatic. You can do it the other way around too. And this one is proven. You can just, if this is true, then the coefficient level recurrence is that one. And from here, you can actually see that this proves uh, what the sum is supposed to be. Um, can I see that? So it finds what the sum is supposed to be. It doesn't go to the product side. I, I don't know any proof of how to go for a product. Okay, yeah. but it might be even good to have not just one recurrence relation, but several of them. Yeah. And then you can put in for y equals one or q or, or q to the minus one or various values and, and combine the different recursions to get maybe a, a formula for, for them, for the, for the, like a product formula. Yeah, maybe, maybe. maybe um, yeah. In a sense, uh, my, my skepticism for Rajesh Ramanjan case comes from this line. Um, Rajesh Ramanjan case is 
uh, a really core case that the recurrence is so simple underneath, I doubt that we will see more than one recurrence or a recurrence that is not an iteration of another minimal recurrence. But in larger cases, it is possible. And I'm actually, actually suspecting that this is going to be the solution, especially when it comes to multi-sums. Okay, because I have, uh, maybe you will show those examples anyway. There are these uh, double sums like uh, Kanade, Russell yes. conjectures. And there, I think it was also the question how to prove that this double sum equals the closed form product. Mm -hmm. And what several people have done is to find a recursion for the sum. Yeah. I think what you did as well. And now the question is, does, is this recursion of any use to prove those identities? That's, that's corresponds that exactly a, to my question. That, that is a perfect question. Um, and so we're talking about Catherine Brinkman, um, Carl Malbrook, and Chris Jane Schaefer. Uh, yeah. They have proven most of the mod 12 identities, and then Rosengren proves the rest of the mod 12 identities. The way that they dealt with those uh, multi-sum equal to product identities were that they guessed a Q difference equation, just as we do. And then they were able to do this manipulation between recurrence and Q difference equation, going back and forth, and show that, that some of these things goes to the product. And this is actually where this package started. Um, I'm, I'm, I was having this conversation with Chris, Christian Schaefer himself, and um, we were saying that this tool where they, they had this guessing tool only program specific, they're problem specific. And Chris was indicating that there was the need for such a general guesser. And that's why we, that's also a reason why we added this guessing option into our package. And we don't know if it is going to be helpful in the kind of the Russell case in the mod nine identities. Still, we don't know, but that is actually where it started. And yeah, we, we have the guest Q difference equations for the kind of the Russell mod nine conjectures. And we can also prove that those objects satisfy these of satisfy these Q difference equations, those identities, but do they go to products? At this moment, we don't have an actual answer. So going back, so go, let's go to the multi-sums where we have more grasp of things. Here's the Caparelli's identities belonging uh, according to Canada and Russell's computer search. They have found the analytic version. The combinatorial theorem was already proven many years ago. So here, here the object is more complicated. Here we have a double sum is equal to the product type identity. And there is a combinatorial the partition theory underneath too, but essentially it is the same thing, but we have an extra sum on one side. So we can actually try to do the same type of game. We can try to play the same type of game, try to introduce a new variable and try to guess if this new bivariate function satisfies, satisfies some sort of a relation, some sort of a Q shift equation. And for that, in the Rajasthan Manjan case, we picked the natural statistics, y to the n, which was counting the number of parts. In Canada and Russell's case, we know that 2n plus m, actually, 2n plus m is actually counting the number of parts. So we can try to introduce this variable in and try to guess a Q difference equation in that matter. So let me do that. Here's the sum that I was just mentioning that I just showed on the slide. It is a Q to the quadratic a divided by a Q pokemon in M, another Q pokemon in N. And here is the statistic, 2N plus M. Now, this is just a different way of calling the same, same function, but it's doing exactly the same thing. I'm trying to guess a Q shift equation. I want to sum things all the way to N being zero, 0 to 20 and M being 0 to 20. My function is going to be called f of x. I expect 
the order of recurrence to be three, and I expect the order of x variable to be three and order of q variable to go all the way to the exponent of the q variable to go all the way to 20. And I'm using the first hundred big O of q to the hundred terms. So essentially we have introduced the natural statistic, the number of parts, and we're asking to see if there's a Q shift equation. And in this multi-sum case, there is no solution, or at least a no, not a simple solution of order three for this natural statistic. This is a bizarre change. Uh, in the single sums, a natural statistics works like a charm. But it seems like in the multi-sums and in, in the kind of the Russell cases too, a natural statistic where they're counting the number of parts is not really, is not really doing, doing the trick. We, we don't find this, we don't find a Q-shift equation in a simple manner. And here you can raise your, raise your values, uh, create a larger search space and find a recurrence. Of course it is, Theoretically, it is there. It is holonomic function. It's a holonomic function after all. Uh, so it's a, there's a recurrence relation it satisfies. But to be able to prove something, some product formula, it is all, also a good idea to start with something simple. So in that sense, we see if, although if the natural statistics is not working, if you were to introduce another statistic, so 3n plus 2m, an unnatural statistic, that means nothing to us in the combinatorial world, in the partition theoretic side of the Caprelli's identity. If you were to introduce this statistic instead and search for a Q shift equation in such a smaller search space, you see that there is actually a Q shift equation. And that is not so bad. It's an order three shift equation that has a Q Pokemon piece here. So it is one minus Q squared X piece on the highest term. So it is, it is a perfect candidate to play this Ketron Brinkman, Karl Malver, Christian Schaefer game. And here, let me play that game a little bit just to show you uh, how, it's, how it's done. We start an unnatural statistic. We guess the Q shift equation then we can move this from a Q shift equation to a Q recurrence equation and see that it is a recurrence of order three. So I have three shifts of N, there's N and the top shift is N plus three. Now we can go back to this Q, Q difference equation and try to do a substitution to kill this term, the highest order uh, Q Pokemon piece uh, the Kupo camera piece at the highest order. That's what the uh, Brinkman Malberg uh, Jen Schaefer game. So we make this substitution. We take our f of x and we replace it with f of x divided by, um, we replace it with f of x times q x q sub infinity. And it gives us this, this difference. So let's. This is set equal to zero, so we can just take, uh, take the numerator of this. I'm taking the whole thing and only combining the numerator of this and changing the name of the function from f to g, just because it's a new function. So now this is the equivalent relation. Instead of this Q-shift equation, now I have this one. The only difference is I don't have that q Pokemon piece on my top shift, but Instead, I paid the price that I get extra terms in my other shifts, one extra term. But the importance of this substitution, this clever substitution is when you look at the recurrence, now your recurrence order drops. From the original Q shift equation, the recurrence order was actually a third order recurrence. So there were three shifts. After making such a substitution, because the coefficient of x uh, as the coefficient of this polynomial is only going up to x to the power two, your recurrence equivalent has a top shift of, uh, the recurrence equivalent has an order of two. 
your shift of n is at most two. And then you can keep on playing this game. Now you can make a substitution in, uh, you can make a substitution in the recurrence level, then you can go back to the difference equation level, then you can try to make another substitution, go back and forth and back and forth. I was hoping to write it as a short note. I was hoping to prove Caprelli's identity once again using this, because I have proven uh, this using this, using the Brinkman, Malbrook, and Jen Schaefer trick. But recently some, some other uh, Japanese group, uh, they, they actually proved, they actually proved some other identities, which I cannot remember what they did, but at the end of their paper, they also mentioned this trick and they, they, they wrote it. They wrote this type of proof of Caparelli's too, so it became irrelevant to type down. Okay, now just as a basic, basic wrapping up of this section, now given any multi-sum, given however many sums you have or a single sum, and actually more variables too, we have implemented that in the Q functions package too, if you have Y, X, Z, more variables, you can try to guess Q difference equations or Q partial differential equations. We don't know how the partial differential equations are gonna be helpful in solving anything, but they are there. And once you guess the Q difference equation, you can try to play this Malbrook, Jen Schaefer, uh, Brinkman game to go to the product side, or you can go to the recurrences and see what, what that looks like and try to make an, try to make a partition theoretic argument over the recurrence, it's all up to you. But the point is now we can actually guess Q difference equations and you can just choose how big of a search space you want to create. And all these calculations that I'm running here are actually running on my computer right now, on my laptop that I'm speaking to, to you from right now. So the calculations are quite, quite fast. In that I have sense. A, a question or comment. Sure. Yeah, so you might not be able to prove the product formulas for the, let's say, rogers romanogen series, but you can easily, with your method of, of obtaining recursions for the, with the Y variable, probably get these algebraic relations for the, for the quotients of, of, the, of the, the rogers romanogen well, the continued fraction expressions. Yes, so this yes. would be equal to the continued fraction expression, right? So yes, yeah. exactly. You have uh, f. You have the the f expression with y equals one divided by the same with y equals q, say, mm -hmm. and and you can get. You should be able by the recursions to 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 obtain algebraic relations for these quotients. That's what I believe should be possible, and you could also ask for similar algebraic relations. For the in the other cases for the Canada Russell uh, yeah. series to get if you don't cannot prove the the formulas themselves the product formulas at least for quotients for suitable quotients to get algebraic relations so maybe that can Canada be automatized. Russell, um, sorry, sorry for cutting you off. Uh, in the Canada Russell cases, um, the best recurrences that we have seen, best shift equations that we have seen are looking like this one. They're of order three. So if you have any ideas of how we can go from this to a more generalized continued fraction, I will be happy to talk to you. I have all of the Q shift equations. We can easily prove them using the other packages as I mentioned, but I don't know where to go from them. So if you have order three, does it mean that you have, uh, are there three contiguous uh, product formulas for them instead of two in the Rogers Romanogen case? Or yes. it, is there, does that oh. correspond to the order of this uh, recurrence relation uh, of the maybe. functional maybe. equation I meant? Um, maybe. And the point of Canada Russell conjectures for the mod nine conjectures where mm -hmm. why they're so well liked is instead of having a pair of identities, as you mentioned in the Rajas yeah. Manjan case, this time we have three identities coming from the same family. Okay, so that corresponds heuristically at least to the order of the functional equation. Yes, um, yes. and another thing is there are also asymmetric 
uh, conjectures of mod nine of Kennedy and Russell, and those also are in three uh, coming in a pair of triplets. But I have to say that um, they're, they're considered to be a pair of uh, asymmetric identities, but I believe uh, these two mod nine groups <laughs> intersect at the tip. So there is one identity that lies in both families. One family is asymmetric, I mean, except for the one exception of the starting point, and a family is symmetric. And as you said, maybe the order here is dominating what the order, how many of these identities we should expect. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, yes. in this case, oh, sorry, no, please. Uh, uh, you know, is this restricting you to consider special values of Q, like rationals or things like that? Um, you, if you want to evaluate these functions at any point, you can, you can choose Q less than size, size being one, and then it would yes. converge no matter what. You, you can evaluate these at any point. Uh, yeah, what I mean is uh, using this so uh, software things, you have to restrict to rational values only, isn't it? No, 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 no. This is all uh, symbolic. This, this is all symbolic. Q is just a symbol. X is just a symbol. You can, you can. Oh, so a symbol comes as symbol only. Yeah, these are all symbolic. So you're much more flexible than that. It's you're not restricted in rational values or anything like that. It's just Q is just any Q. X is just any X. So, so how do you eventually use the software then? Uh, you mean, so I, do you mean how do I use the software to prove such an identity or do you mean? No, not prove, I mean to utilize, utilize in different uh, cases. So the way of utilizing this to make different guesses is you can always change the statistic. That's what we did in many cases. So we took our object of interest we introduce many different statistics and we guess these Q-shift equations. So once we hit a Q-shift equation, once we have something that we can work with, we knew that we can prove it using other symbolic implementations and we proved it in some other cases or we proved them by hand. And we also did these manipulations from uh, substitutions and manipulations from recurrence equations to shift equations, differential equations, as you like, symbolically to eliminate any mistake that we might make uh, by hand and just just utilize the software that way. Oh, so you mean you simplify the actual calculation uh, by this software and come to a plausible form or something? Yes, okay. yes. This portion of this software is to guess Q shift equations because we know if we have the guess, we can prove them. Okay, okay. Yeah, so this portion is just to make guesses because here, especially with the new identities of this form where we have multi sums is equal to products, which was, there were examples of these uh, coming from weighted words, which is gonna be the next thing that we talked about actually. Um, so, they were, but these so multi like sums say, carry on So all this is exact, no approximation oh, yeah. at all. No. Okay. No. Thank you. Thank you. Not a problem. These are all exact formulas. Plus, we okay. can prove them. Right now, they're guesses, but we can easily prove them using other factors. Thank you. Thank you. And not a problem. Not a problem. Okay. So maybe uh, we can do some questions later, Ali. So carry on. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, but one last thing is which I completely forget what I was gonna say. It doesn't matter, so let's carry on. Oh yeah, that, the thing that I want to say is this. Multi sums is equal to products is quite new in this field and we don't know how to handle them. Like these type of identities uh, came around the time when I received my PhD, which was 2017. So we still don't know, we still are building tools to deal with multi sums is turning into products. So any tool that we have is becoming more valuable to us by the day. Okay, let's move on to the next thing. So the first part was experimental. We were guessing these particular types of identities and symbolically we can manipulate them as we like. 
this portion is completely symbolic that there was this technique of partitions that were dealing with the gap conditions. And now using the original theory and uh, just combining that with the new, new method of Jahan Dus, new spin on this theory with Jahan Dus, we can now actually do the bulk of the calculations using a computer and it's all symbolic. So let me explain what a method of weighted verse is. It is introduced by Krishna Ladi and uh, Basil Gordon, later used by many people. Uh, most notably, I would say, uh, Alex Berkovich, Krishna Ladi, and George Andrews in, in the proof of the big Gilman's theorem. Um, this method is just to abstractify the difference conditions that we mentioned. In the Raja Samanjan, the gap condition was two. Here, it is to abstract abstractify that idea of gap condition. So you start with colors that will correspond to the congruence condition to the other side of the world that is going to be interpreted and in, uh, included with an alphabet. And then we will talk about the difference only. So let's start with an alphabet. You pick an alphabet, pick an order. I will pick A, B, and C in this order. A is less than B, less than C. You can pick any order that you like. Then you make a full list. Then you can say there are A1, B1, C1. Then there's A2, B2, C2, A3, B3, C3, so on and so forth. So you make your numbers into a three colored list. And the first level has this order, then comes the second level, then comes the third level, so on and so forth. This is the same thing as taking your integers and ordering, uh, just grouping them with respect to their congruence. So this is one, that is two, that is three, that is four, that is five. So one mod trees are all A, two mod trees are all B, zero mod trees are all C. So you color with respect to the congruence class, then we will talk about the gap condition, the difference condition. And for that, you can just start saying, put in restrictions as you like. One restriction might be, you can just say, I want all the partitions where BN and AN cannot come together. I don't want B3 and A3 to be in the same partition, but I'm okay with B3 and A2 coming together. So this is just a gap condition. So you're saying from B3, you're not supposed to come to A3, but from B3, you can make a bigger jump. And you can just put these restrictions for any combination of A's and B's between A's, between B's, between C's. This creates what is called a gap matrix. And here, here, is, here is an example of it. We can read this as from, from an A, B, or C to an A, B, or C. And we would read this, if you want to go from a C to an A, you look at their intersection, if you want to go from a C to an A, you need to go at least one index down. So it's the same as saying C3 and A3 are not supposed to come together, but C3 and A2 is okay. You need to go at least one index down. And here, another one from B to B, you want to go one step down. From a C to a B, you're, you can just say, that is okay for me that you don't need to go a step down. It's from a C5, I can go to a B5. That is just a gap condition. All the gaps are encoded this way. And the point is, this type of gap, gap matrix creates a system of these, of these uh, restrictions. And then in the generating function level, if you were to look at the generating functions where you bound the largest part, you would be uh, looking at a system of recurrences where you keep track of the largest part. And depending on the color, you would have three different generating functions where the largest part is. And this creates a system of recurrences for these three generating functions. Okay, yeah. We look at the generating function for these things where the largest part is at A and B and or C N, and exponent of Q keeps track of the Q N. And you can create the system of recurrences. And we can now do that automatically. So you can just say, here's my matrix. That is the example matrix that we gave. Here's my colors, A, B, and C. 
and please give me the function in G name. You can just see that it gives you system of three recurrences. Uh, let me do it in table form. Three recurrences, again, set to equal to zero. And the point is once you have a recurrent system, you can try to prove it. This is all symbolic. This is all proven. You can take it as proven. Given the matrix, you can easily generate the system of recurrences. And the point is, if you have the system of recurrences, you can try to look for a solution of the system of recurrences. But for that, you might need to uncouple the system to see a relation between one family of functions so that a family A function doesn't depend on family C function. So you uncouple the recurrences. This can be done automatically as well. But this portion is where we rely on the Grubner basis calculations of uh, Christoph Kuchan, my, my boss nowadays, and the author of the whole numeric functions. And you can uncouple the system. Now, as you can see, the first recurrence is only GA going into GA. The second one is just GB going into GB, GC going into GC. And this is a simple system. But in general, once you uncouple the system, you can also search if there is a solution. So you can take your uncoupled system recurrence, set it equal to zero, and say, is there a solution? And if there is, sigma, if there's a simple solution, sigma of Karsten Schneider would find it. These are all symbolic answers. This is an answer that is already proven for you. That is that this system equal to zero has this product as a solution. And from A, B, and C, if you want to go back to normal numbers, normal integers, you just need to do a couple of shifts. As we mentioned, A's needs to get tagged with just one more trees, B's needs to tag with two more trees, and so on and so forth. So you can easily do that and see that it's, that it's a normal product that we can mention, that we can find. So we started with gap conditions. That was the weighted verse. We uncoupled the system, looked for a solution. We got lucky. We found the product. And this is all proven this time. So going to this, whoop. yeah, so here, whoop. here's what it is. So we started the gap matrix, then we found the product. And that is done by Carson Schneider's Sigma package. You can go for other examples too. Um, the first proof, uh, first this method was used is used on Schur's theorem. So we can prove the Schur's theorem here too. It's a, it's a larger theorem, but though my computer decided to have it, take a break. But in general, you can just take any matrix. This is a two by two matrix. You can create a system of recurrences. You can uncouple this system using holonomic functions, search for a solution. This time it says there's only one particular solution and that particular solution is zero. So no luck this time. You can try another solution. Uh, oh yeah, you can try to specify your functions. You can try to make it into a weighted identity and look for a weighted identity in a, in a way. And then you might be lucky and find a solution for this system. So actually I believe the method of weighted birds going forward is going to be a great asset for weighted identities. And I know Atul, at least you're interested in weighted type partition identities. Absolutely, so, yes. Uh, as you can see, we start an abstract case, but once we specify some values, although we couldn't solve the general, general uh, family, with weighted families, we might be able to solve these weighted families and then we both see analytic identities and we, both, we are going to see these type of weighted partition counts. Okay, so method of weighted words is basically this. So you start with colors, as many as you like. I, I did two and three, but you can just pick eight colors and you'll be able to solve it. it will take a little bit more time. And then you can go and search for solutions for your system. Um, and the last portion, I would say, last symbolic portion is cylindric partitions. This is another paradigm. Here, instead of working with a single partition, there's a definition of a cylindric partition where there is a vector partition, vector of partitions. 
and they satisfy some relationships. This can be explained, but it is actually irrelevant to what we want to do. Um, it is a really combinatorial idea. It is a really combinatorial object, really nice. But instead of taking one partition, this time, just think about it as we are taking many partitions that satisfies some relations. And we're counting these objects. Recently, Sylvie Cortiel decided to look at this bivariate generating function for these objects. And this is, as you can see, it's a bivariate object. It looks like the first part that we talked about. And what happened is she knew, she knew from representation theory side when y is equal to one, this was supposed to be a product. She knew that we can get the product for free. Borodin has in 2007 proved that these cylindric partitions, these objects have a product representation. These generating objects satis satisfy a product representation. This is a huge asset for Q series research because sum is equal to product identities. Usually jumping to the product side is quite hard and some side is what we work with. But this time we get the product side for free and hopefully we can match it with the sum side. So she knew, uh, Sylvie Cortil knew that at y equals one, this was a product. So she decided to build her theory over when y is not one and then restrict it to y is one. So she made a simple, uh, simple substitution first and then showed that this g functions satisfy such a relation such a recurrence relation where I'm not gonna explain what J, this J is supposed to mean. It is, it is not a bit big deal. It is just taking off the maximum and where the next maximum can be. There is just, there's a connection between them. Um, as I write it, uh, this paper is Sylvie Cortiel only, A2 rational modular identities, but later um, there's, uh, she, uh, they have added another co-author. So now it is Sylvie Cortiel and Thomas Welsh. So this type of recurrence and explicit recurrence is music to my ears because I can implement this in Mathematica. So I have implemented this recurrence in Mathematica. So you can pick any profile, whatever that might mean that defines the, gen the cylindric partitions. You can get your coupled system of recurrences, coupled system of Q shift equations. And then you can basically do the same thing that you did in weighted words. You can try to solve this system. So, you can pick any profile that you like. Here's an example. You can put, pick a profile of three zero and two one. And it gives you some relations between your functions and some shifts in the variables. Or you can define them in a full set of two elements adding up to two. Uh, adding up to three. So it is the same system, but now done in bulk. And here are these functions in your system. You can turn them into recurrences for the coefficients of these uh, generating functions. And once you're in the co coefficient level, you can do exactly what we did in the weighted verse. You can just try to uncouple them and see if you can prove, uh, if you can uh, solve these objects. And here are two recurrences. The first one for the two one coefficient. And the second one is for the three zero coefficient. And these are order one recurrences. So if you were to look at the first one and play with it a little bit, you see that this is showing that we end up at register mantra sum with the extra y equals n. And the great part is at y equals one, we knew that it's supposed to be a product and at y equals one, this is the Rajasthan Mojang product with an extra copy of Q, Q infinity. So this cylindric partitions paradigm proves Rajasthan Mojang identity directly as a, as a byproduct. Of, oh, um, can I take two more minutes? Okay, I gotta go too, but let me just to simply wrap it up. So with this paradigm, we can easily solve more identities this way too. So here we were able to prove other identities coming from other 
other centric profiles. And here's an example. So we were able to prove such an identity, which simplifies to an identity that is equivalent to uh, Bresut's identities. And even more, we have added experimental fitting tools of experimental fitting tools to our package. So you can give it a sequence of polynomials. Here I'm giving one, one plus two Q, one plus two Q, so on and so forth. And ask if there is a good fitting of any representation using binomials, trinomials, TN trinomials, so on and so forth. And given this sequence of polynomials, in this case, we have found that there is a binomial fitting with these coefficients and with these polynomial coefficients. And this seems quite nice. This can lead to other representations of such messy fourfold sums. Fourfold sum is equal to product identity. With that, you can actually find different representations where you can simplify these things as two twofold sums. Bilateral but twofold sums is equal to the same product. So, and this type of identities are also, we, we, we can easily prove using the other risk packages. So the point is to start at the cylindric partitions paradigm because we get the products for free and then try to find a sum representation, which is harder than it seems, but tends to be easier than proving that it's a product. And once you have the, once you have the sum representation, tying things together. So right now I'm actually writing a paper with uh, Cortiel and Deuce on, on this, on a different profile. So yeah, with that, I want to wrap it up. So this package has the experimental tools to guess Q difference equations and experimental tools to fit polynomial identities with known functions and symbolic tools to manipulate and go between shift equations and recurrence equations and all those type of doing substitutions, symbolic tools to do the weighted verse from start to finish, basically from start of the matrix, going all the way to uncoupling the recurrences and going for the product. And these uh, symbolic tools to go for the cylindric partitions to actually just create the system and uncouple that. And then it comes down to guessing and finding what the sum representations of these functions are supposed to be. So yeah, with that, I want to thank you all. And yeah, thanks for having me. Okay, thank you, Ali, very nice talk. Um, um, I just want, if there are any questions? Sure, yeah. Yeah. Any questions? So I have a question. Uh, can you uh, just briefly indicate what ideas you use to you know to find the recurrence relation in at least the first one um the so, idea which we can do by hand and then you know you implemented it in the computer is it some yeah. oh yeah, yeah so certainly all of these ideas you you can technically do by hand but you don't want to um in the finding the q difference equations as an example it is we're making an ansatz we're making an assumption that if we were to create this huge linear system of equations, then there is going to be a solution. Okay. What you do is you just write down these functions, write down these polynomials, and put all these free variables in, then collect the collect them under the exponents of x. So you say x to the one has this polynomial as a coefficient, and that is supposed to be zero. X to the two has the, these things, and that is supposed to be zero. X to the three has these coefficients, uh, this polynomial, free polynomial, and that is supposed to be zero. And it creates a huge linear system of equations. And then you, you try to reduce it with the data that you have. And with the data, as, as you see, as you replace, as you reduce, you either end up having one solution, multiple solution, or no solutions. Basically, so it's a, just an experimental tool. You just create a big system, try to reduce that matrix. In the second one, in the weighted verse, it is exactly how you would do by hand. You just say, if I have the largest part to be this, and if I'm allowed to go this many steps down, this many steps down, this many steps down, what is the next generating function that I can combine things under? 
And if I'm allowed to go this many steps down, and so on and so forth. So you just do the combinatorics in the second value, second group. In the third group, there's an explicit formula. So all of these things, technically, you can do by hand, but you wouldn't want to. Yeah. Any other questions? Maybe you can um, uh, stop sharing Ali for a bit so that we can see more people. Um, I, can, I can do that too. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So, okay, so. Um, there is also some insight uh, to how we are doing things in the paper. So if you want to look, take a look at the paper, it is structured and it gives you a lot of examples from start to finish of how we're doing things. Yeah, yeah. guys, can you uh, start your videos and maybe if there are any questions from Ali for Ali? We are in the dark. Um, I see that from Arit Ramdar uh, that he, he actually correctly mentions uh, Sills and Schneider, Robert Schneider recently said that the norm of a partition is supposed to be the product of all the parts. But I, I did say that the norm of partition was the sum of the parts much, much earlier than them. So, and I know the biggest opposer of using norm as the word is Andrew Sills. And so, and I, I like Andrew quite a lot. So I'm trying to switch to size. But norm was the norm before. Norm was used more commonly than size before. The norm was the norm. Norm was the norm, but nowadays we need to change it to size. Yeah, okay. Any, any other questions? So I hope okay, you can so use this package as it would be helpful in yes, one shape, for, shape or form in your research. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if there are any, uh, uh, if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker. But uh, uh, you know, please hang around to uh, say hello to him if you if you don't have any place to. So I guess, yeah, this is a good way to clap. But thank, you. thank you, Ali. Very nice. uh, thank you, thank nice. you. So we can hang around a bit and just chat a little bit. I mean, normally we would be having tea somewhere, but uh, I guess that's not possible. Yeah, maybe I can stay for another two minutes, let's say, but then I need to go too, because as you remember, I need to vacate my office by one. Oh, so right. that my office mate can take over. Okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's just the corona rules. <laughs> yeah. Then thank you. We, uh, thanks a lot for uh, coming in. And, uh, yeah, maybe next time we can talk. Maybe nice. next time we can sit and chat for a bit. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. It was great. Um, and it definitely creates something to do in this corona times. I'm really happy to see, your, see all your faces. It's really good to see you. Yeah, and... Nice to meet all of the people that I met now. Uh, I would like to mention that Hansiraj Gupta did a lot of preliminary work on theory of partitions. He sat and computed tables and the, his work That's has true. been uh, assembled in two volumes by Rajinderjit Hansgill and Madhu Raka and published by Ramanujan Math Society, I think, in 2013 or something. Yes, that, that is completely true. Gupta's uh, yes. theory of partitions book is a great asset. He calculates the number of partitions a lot for the first, I would say 2000 partitions, he calculates it explicitly. Yes. And it is even available on the web. You can easily read it. It is a great asset. He tends to do it using um, our heart theory, our heart polynomials. Yes. But it's yes. a really, really nice asset. It's a, definitely an honorable mention. Yes. It is a great, great asset to have. Yeah, Gupta's books are... Uh. I just want to mention there is a virtual math fest uh, next week in India with a lot of participants. Mm -hmm. And search for virtual math fest uh, 
it's also listed i believe on research seminars.org on mit website but if you search for virtual math fest and if you are interested in any of the lectures you can register and it's all free and so i am taking note of that i will definitely check that thank you for letting us know send link to gaurav and he can uh, circulate sure. Oh. sure sounds good Another thing, Hugh Montgomery was my country.